Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and the livestock to do the same. Following me and sharing my videos is really very important. I am a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising, and so social media is how I grow. So please follow me on Twitter at SYLTales and any other social media. I'm on all of them known to man. You can find them on the About page on my channel. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. So, Star Trek Picard, Season 1, Episode 4, Absolute Candor. Uh, I guess as a non-spoiler review, I can tell you that this was not a good episode in many respects. It introduces a philosophy that makes no sense. Very little happens in it. In fact, my first response at the end of the episode was I actually said, just blurted out, That's it? That's all? And this has really something to do with the dramatic structure that I talked about, and it reinf is reinforced in my videos, Star Trek, Discovery, and Picard will not age well. And there's a link to those in that in my description box. So that is the uh, non-spoiler review. Um, now, unlike other, other reviewers, I don't sit down and rehash the plot, pausing to say what I liked or I didn't like. You'll get far more depth out of me than any other reviewer, and I will touch on everything that goes into making a film, whether it's acting, directing, cinematography, or etc. So we'll just take it as read that if you've come to this video looking for a review, then you probably already watched Star Trek Picard Season 4, Episode uh, 4, Season 1, Episode 4, Absolute Candor, or you just don't care if it's spoiled. But nevertheless, for safety's sake, we should probably issue a... Uh, Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fan die master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. And this is neither a boast nor a brag. This is unfortunately where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years' worth of science fiction. The problem with fan die masters is that we are cursed. You just can't see all the new stuff without seeing the century that came before. You discover there's not very much that's very original, and it sometimes interferes with your ability to enjoy things. One thing I do not do, I will never do, is outrage videos. There are a lot of reviewers who are simply actors portraying outrage because it sells. They hate everything with an e-jerk reflex because their viewers want to see them hate things. And this causes sort of a weird feedback loop between fandom and popular YouTubers because the YouTubers will hate something and then the fan people with fandoms will hate it. YouTubers will keep on making hating, 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 hating. And ultimately it becomes a situation where nobody can actually enjoy much of anything no matter how good it is. Now I don't do that. If I like something, I'll tell you why in detail. If I dislike it, I'll tell you why in detail. But I do not do outrage. Unlike other reviewers, I am the adult in the room. So reviewing this episode, Absolute Candor. I usually talk about great moments, things that I liked about the video or a TV show or film. Uh, just to, you know, be cool, say something nice. Um, so great moments on this. Soji and Narek drinking Romulan ale from the same bottle style as we saw in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, was a good callback. Soji supposedly arriving on the board cube and on the spaceship Ellison was a nice little touch. This could only be a reference to legendary author Harlan Ellison, who wrote what is arguably the best episode of Star Trek in the entire franchise, the original series episode, The City on the Edge of Forever. However, as with most uh, the, the events of Star Trek Discovery, like many episodes of that series, mean that the events of the original series couldn't have happened or would have been severe, severely different to fit into the Discovery universe. And I don't care what people say about that. That's true. Discovery is so violating of anything we knew about canon that much of the original series would have to be completely remade in order to fit that. Deal, guys who like Discovery. 
And that unfortunately also includes the city on the edge of a river. You would have to rewrite that. Those are my good moments. That's all there was. This was not a good episode. I have a lot of cringe moments. All of this ultimately devolves to the writing. First off, the phrase, bite me. This is a very recent American English colloquialism that originated, I believe, with The Simpsons. I might be wrong about that, but it's very recent. It is highly unlikely that that's going to survive 400 years, particularly among Romulans. Why is there only one place on this planet that looks like Rivendell from Lord of the Rings? In order for an ecosystem like that to exist, it is an absolutely requirement that some good portion of the planet must be lush. You don't get waterfalls and plant life without there being a significant and regular source of water. Why is there a sign saying Romulans only when there are only Romulans on this planet? Their planetary defense system prevents almost anyone from beaming down or coming down unless they're explicitly told they can. Why do they need this stupid sign? Uh, walking down the stairs, something I noticed while being dematerialized, uh, sounds like a really great way to fall on your face when you materialize on a flat surface like a transporter pad. There are now multiple holograms doing multiple jobs on La Serena. Um, if that's possible, then why are there any human crew members on any spaceships? They're, they'd be totally redundant. You could have nothing but holograms running them. Speaking in multiple languages, by the way, when in battle is a really bad idea. You need unfettered communication between your crew or you are going to get in trouble. Now, the entire incident at the bar and the subsequent beheading of the belligerent Romulan is all Picard's fault. What did he expect was going to happen? His presence inflamed the situation. Elnor is not to blame um, for the, the beheading. Once he became Picard's protector, he did exactly what his culture demanded. It wasn't his fault that Picard started causing trouble. Now, El Elnor, to you know, to make maybe a little, he could have um, told the Romulans in advance that he was Picard's protector, and the belligerent Romulan might well have backed off or at least chosen to fight with Elnor rather than some old man. Now, it seems also kind of odd to me <laughs> that Picard would recreate his study on a holodeck. Because I thought part of the reason that he'd left it behind was because he figured out that really where he wanted to be was in the stars. Why take that with you? Oh, here's a good one. Quote, the quote, Romulans, uh, Romulan warrior, warrior nuns, that's bizarre. Hey, Dr. Girardi would be good at cringe moments. Absolute candor is an absolute recipe for, well, chaos and death. Sometimes you need to filter what you think and what you say. What we see this, by the way, today in social media. No one filters what they say about anything to anyone. And the result has been chaos, anger, and death threats, some of which have actually been successful. You must filter your emotions and thoughts sometimes. And Picard is a skilled diplomat. He, he damn well knows this. If a diplomat doesn't filter, then there will be no diplomacy, only warfare. How does uh, an order that only pledges their services to a lost cause survive? By definition, most or all of them would be killed. Like a hundred soldiers with phaser rifles against one guy with a sword, that's a lost cause, and he's going to die. <laughs> an ancient Borg ritual that involves taking off your shoes and sliding down a quarter is stupid. I certainly hope that this is just Narek playing Soji. Because in the first base, play, Borg don't have shoes to remove. Whatever's on their feet is integrated into them. They can't take them off. But more importantly, a collective a hive mind that placed order and functionality above all else would find the idea irrational. I mean, just look at Seven of Nine. She found damn near any human recreational activity an irrational waste of her time precisely because to the Borg it had no purpose. I cannot see the Borg ever doing this. If um, two smallish spaceships can make short work of a 23rd century Romulan bird of prey, 
then it should have been destroyed long before now by somebody else. And they've talked in the past about, uh, you know, planetary defense grids in Star Trek without, you know, really specifying it. Now that it's specified, it's kind of stupid. And by the way, where did these destitute Romulans living in poverty and filth in a place that looks like Rivendell, where did they get the power to keep this thing running all the time? I mean, they say some other race helped them erect it, but then they'd still have to have ongoing power to keep it running. Where do they get that on an impoverished race's salary? Um, <clears throat> how does even a, sing a single android or even an army of them cause the death of all life everywhere as stated? The universe is infinite. Um, it, even the Federation, which is more than a thousand worlds, there must be trillions or even quadrillions of individual. How are some androids going to kill them all? How, is that, how would that work? It's just silly. Why, in the battle, did the bird of prey not use its most devastating weapon, the plasma weapon? It would have utterly destroyed the, La, La Serena in one shot. Why did the Borg, bird of, I mean, sorry, why did the Romulan bird of prey not use its cloaking device? The tactical advantages are obvious. It's why the Romulans developed the thing in the first place. Why is everyone bitching at Picard for not saving everyone? As the last episode made perfectly clear, it was not his fault. The Federation chose to abandon the Romulans, and he did everything possible to change that. All Picard would have had to do in this episode, where everybody has to say the truth about everything, is that tell the truth. <laughs> he, he had no say in it at all. Just tell the truth. Now, Picard just doesn't have anything to be guilty about, no matter how hard he tries. I mean, he may feel bad about what happened, but absolutely nothing was his fault. And then there's the one, a ranged weapon like a disruptor is no match for a melee weapon like a sword. Well, the Romulan who said it would be good at cringe moments. What's the big problem with Elnor living amongst the warrior nuns? They seem to have no problem raising him. Even his being male meant that he could never hold a position within their order. Why did he grow up so angry in the place that looks like Rivendell? Seven of nine is apparently some kind of mercenary or something now. I sure hope not. It's also been said that Rizzo is Narek's sister. I don't know if that's necessarily true or not, but that was said once. Yet her body language with him has undeniable sexual overtones that if she is his sister are kind of incestuous. And this made me uncomfortable. Without clearing this up and saying she's not his sister makes me uncomfortable. Frankly, if it didn't make you uncomfortable, I kind of worry that you're watching um, incest videos on Pornhub. This is a big one. Narek and Soji's relationship seems largely to be based on sexual attraction. Now, I've had conversations with my Padawans on this that say, oh, no, no, this is just adult themes. That's good. Well, no, it's not. It's stupid writing. Now, for my Padawans, I must tell you, sex is a component of an adult relationship, but often not the most important part. It has, it has been a tragedy that you have been socialized to believe that sex is the most important thing in a relationship. It frankly explains why your relationships tend to be very shallow and rarely last very long. An adult relationship is based on adult circumstances. Now, as an example of a true adult relationship, I would point you to Sam Carter and Pete Shanahan on Star Trek, I'm sorry, on Stargate SG-1. Now, Sam and Pete were romantically linked uh, they were, their relationship grew over a period of time in an adult way. They were even engaged for a time. And though sex was never shown on screen, a little making out, it was certainly implied that that was going on. The real adult part of their relationship was Sam's job. She could tell Pete absolutely nothing about what she did because it was classified. Sam could be gone for days or even weeks, and she couldn't tell Pete why. She might even be killed, and he would never know how or why. This placed an enormous strain on their relationship in an adult way. It was a real problem that sex would never overcome. And while Pete ultimately did learn about the Stargate program, there was still an enormous strain on their relationship due to Sam's job, 
and it led ultimately to the two breaking up. You see, that is an adult-themed relationship. A couple of people banging is not. It's just lazy writing for the Padawans, who have been socialized to believe that relationships really are all about sex. And frankly, I pity you, my Padawans. I really do. Because you'll never know the joys of truly being in love. Well, getting out from uh, that out of fringe, cringe moment, so I always start out with the writer rather than actors or anybody else. Because if you don't have a script, you ain't got nothing to shoot. Writer on this one was Michael Chabon. I talked about him quite a lot last week. Um, in brief, the writing here is crap. As my cringe moments make clear, there is so much stupid, so many things that make no sense, so many characters with poor and or stupid motivations. And I find this surprising, given all the great work that Siobhan has done. The guy has won a Hugo Award, which is always impressive to me, much more than the Pulitzer they won. But this right here is crap. As an aside, by the way, Siobhan's recently posted a video explaining why the many inconsistencies between Picard and Star Trek The Next Generation make no sense. Here's a newsflash. If you actually explain it outside the episode, that means you wrote crap for the episode. But in any case, there was one particular thing that he said that I took um, umbrage to, which is his position on swearing in Star Trek. And he really claimed that it was really only due to censorship. And while that's to some extent true, the fact is that even back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, even if there was censorship, it would not have occurred to those writers to use those words, because this is nonsense. His whole claim is nonsense. Chabon is only rationalizing. The real reason is that he knows that these words are the only words that he can be sure that his audience understands. And I've done a whole video on this. Swearing in Star Trek is for the uneducated. And I have a link to that in my description box below. We can get into acting Sir Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard. Again, I think my entire reviews for this whole series are going to be, it's Patrick Stewart. He is probably the most, he's probably the premier actor of our era. I have never seen him do anything bad. He certainly doesn't do anything bad here. He's given dumb things in terms of motivations, dumb things in terms of not saying that I, this is not my fault. I did every level damn thing I could. I apologize. It's too bad you guys you know, didn't get what I promised, but I had nothing to do with it. Higher, higher level. Uh, you know, aside from that, aside from that, he, he, he still takes what he's given and he makes it work. I, I think one of the hallmarks of a great actor is when you can take crap material and still somehow make it work. And then there is Santiago Cabrera as Chris Rios and all of the holograms. <laughs> uh, his performance here is fine. He doesn't really have uh, any characterization type things to do. But he does the have, in this case, two different holograms that appear on the ship. And it allows him to show off his range, which is something that a lot of people don't get a chance to do. A lot of actors don't get a chance to do. They only get to play one character... If they're going to be really weird about it, they make a mirror episode where they play a different character or you know, evil duplicate, evil twin character. But most of the time, you just play the one character. So he's getting to show his range here, and that's kind of nice. We do have Michelle Hurd as Rafi. Again, not a hell of a lot for her to do here. This is a, definitely a rafi uh episode. Um, mostly she was doing her function on this ship with a little talking to Card about, hey, do we have to stop here? Uh, Issa Brones as Soji, again, uh, doing a good job here. Uh, again, not a ton of stuff with her. She's going to definitely have to, you know, figure much more prominently in later episodes. But what she does here, I believe, I don't know, I believe that she's got uh, got her thing on for, um, for for the Romulan guy. But, you know, in terms of other things she has to do, it's not... Not that much characterization, so we'll see more of her as we go along. Allison Pill as a Dr. Agnes Girati. Well, yes. Um, again, good performance. She's kind of the scaredy one of the bunch, which makes sense. She hasn't gone to space and stuff like that like they have. But, again, not a ton to do. More a catalyst for expeditional dialogue than anything else. 
Uh, Harry Treadway as Narek. Again, good performance from here, him here, especially when he's with his sister and when he appears to be, in any case, playing Soji. Um, uh, you know, I don't have any problem with what he's showing here. There's not much in terms of characterization. I think we're going to probably get down the road a rather stereotypical thing where he has fallen in love with Soji for real or something stupid like that. But as long as he's just playing her, I like that. I don't know if she's just playing him too, kind of doubt it. But uh, I do like that, and I do like, you know, the fact that he's getting into trouble with Rizzo. I hope, sure, her, sure hope it turns out she's not his sister, like they said. But we'll see. Um, again, good performance. I have no problem with that. Peyton List as Rizzo. Not a hell of a lot for her to do here, again, aside from be a bitch. Uh, although, again, she has all this body language uh, that uh, if she is his sister, kind of borders on the incestuous and made me uncomfortable. Evan uh, Ivagora as Elnor. Oh, Elnor. Hmm, Elnor. No, seriously. Elnor? He also just happens to look a hell of a lot like Elrond as played by uh, Hugo Weaving. And their names differ by only one letter, with the others being in a slightly different order. I mean, this is more on point than even Morn from Deep Space Nine. His name, by the way, if you don't know, if you're a young Padawan and never saw that, was taken from Norm, a character on the popular 1990s TV series sitcom Cheers. Does it take a Fandai master to see this? <laughs> Or can Padawan see this as well? In any case, I saw this and I went, all right. The director is Jonathan Frakes. No introduction should be necessary to anyone who's watched Star Trek before. I did, interesting, because I, I looked him up and I saw that he has won an award. He won uh, an award from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films in 2013. He won a Lifetime Achievement Award. Seems a little early to give him a Lifetime Achievement Award, but hey, what the heck. He's also got two Hugo, Hugo nominations. Hasn't been one. Hasn't won any. In terms of his direction, I have now seen a lot of Frake's work and have started to recognize his directorial style. When you get into intimate moments, he likes kind of slowly moving the camera around the characters. And it is generally effective. It works. But once you've seen him do it repeatedly over various shows and you know series, it really becomes kind of uncreative. The rest of the other direction tends to be rather statically shot. And while he only resorts to shot reverse shot, that is where I'm talking to somebody over here, and then they put the camera on the back of them, and they're talking to me over here, well, they don't do a lot of shot reverse shot. I would still say that the directing here is not as inspired as some of the directing that we've been seeing. Director of photography was Darren Tiernan. Now, as always, my regular viewer is going to get sick of me hearing, say, hearing me say this. I'll say it as quickly as I can. Director's job is to tell what they, shots they want. Cinematographer's job is to get those shots. But sometimes, hopefully, you have a collaboration where the two of them get together and maybe the cinematographer says, yeah, I can get you that shot, but what if we do it slightly differently, light it slightly differently, take advantage of something we have on the set to make it look cool? And they'll, they'll canoodle and say, yeah, that's a good idea, and maybe you'll have some back and forth. And we certainly hope that that's what's going on here. In terms of the cinematography here, it is all perfectly well shot. Um, he got the shots that uh, Jonathan Frakes wants. I don't know how much more input he would have had than that, but he got the shots. They were lit well. Um, and uh, you could, you know, what little action there was, you could certainly follow the fight scene and, and where you weren't supposed to be able to see what caused the uh, beheading. Um, that's, that works OTA okay too. By the way, a quick word on that beheading. I think it's over the top for Star Trek. Um, I don't like to see beheading in my Star Trek. The same reason that I don't watch beheading videos when, like, um, you know, ISIS or Muslim terrorists show them. That's disgusting. If you aren't disgusted by that on some level, then there's something wrong with you. Seek professional help. If you aren't disgusted by beheadings like that one, seek professional help because there's something wrong with you. 
The production designer was Todd Chernowski, has been in the rest of the episodes. Now, something that I have not mentioned before, and probably should have, and I'm going to mention it several times in several different places in this. One of the problems with Star Trek, the original series, and later Star Trek, the next generation, is that it's sort of baked into the franchise. Things that shouldn't have been baked in. Now, one of these is production design. Now, because the circular shape of the Enterprise Bridge became so familiar and iconic with Star Trek. Later incarnations of the franchise tended to see the same general layout for the bridge that we saw for every single alien ship that we ever saw. Now, this just never made any sense. I mean, sure, Starfleet's bridges look similar because they're supposed to be modular, and for that matter, you can take them out and replace them completely with another one. It's why they put the thing in one of the most vulnerable areas of the ship. But alien spacecraft didn't need to have a captain's chair in the middle, um, a couple of self-contained you know, uh, stations in the front to the sides, and generally some kind of circular thing surrounding that. It's, the fact is that aliens are going to have some very different ide ideas about design aesthetics. So when we see something different on either a Federation ship, even if it's something like a callback like it is, like La Sirena, it is still nice to see that the production designer has unbaked this part of the franchise. This should never have been baked in in the first place, and taking it out was good. And by the way, just as a point of information, making the front of any bridge a window is just a stupid idea. There's planned, the breaking point of Transparent aluminum has got to be considerably lower than the breaking point of titanium. So one good shot to the bridge with a giant window and all of a sudden, boom, and your entire bridge crew goes blowing out into space. A view screen may not be as dramatic as a window, but it's sure a hell of a lot more realistic. <laughs> Music as always, Jeff Russo. Um, this is another one. Where Star Trek, the original series, and uh, Next Gen Era really, really baked into the franchise was its music. This got really bad in Rick Berman's era because he made a conscious choice for the composers to tone down the music so that it wasn't something that shot out at you, which is a bad thing to do. Um, bombastic really works when Star Trek, and there's some kind of action. By toning it down, it became pretty boring, and there are very few Berman-era scores that, you know, are really mentionable or rememberable. Um, you know, basically opening title sequences, those are the things you remember. Um, pardon me, I just lost my space on my uh, thing here, music. I think it is, um, you know, when we hear something different, when we hear something different from Picard, because even if there's a, you know callbacks occasionally to original series Maestro, Maestro Alexander Courage or Next Gen, actually motion picture, Maestro Jared Goldsmith's themes, it is still see to the, that the composer has completely unbaked this part of the music. The music serves what's going on and the action is very good. I'm still going to have to listen to some of this composer's work more to decide whether or not they're at a maestro level for me, but we still have unbaked this problem with the music that we've had during the entire Berman era, so that's great. Visual effects supervising producer is uh, ja Jason Zimmerman. Um, the only real criticism I have about uh, any of the special effects is what we call consequence-free action. Now, in Star Trek, the original series, they did not have anything like the kind of necessary technology to show a real space battle. What they did instead was they would have, you know, something hit the ship and then the ship would rock. Everybody would rock in their chairs. Maybe there'd be an explo you know, explosion of fireworks here or a GNDN conduit would drop down out of, you know, who knows. But those were all things that were supposed to be consequences of the action. But that's not really what consequences are. Now, when they got consequences of actions right, it was in the 2009 Star Trek movie. And now what I mean by the consequences in, if you see a ship getting hit and the hull is punctured, you can then show the inside of that ship. And there's one particular shot at the beginning with the Kelvin where this happens. The, uh, there's a hole blown in a corridor. The people in the corridor scream and are sucked out into space, and then there's no sound. Very, very good. You know, you can see that this just 
It's not just this. It's the consequences are people are dying. You know, so having consequence-free battles isn't a good thing. Now, while there was a consequence, a big one, when Seven of Nine's ship was destroyed, in general, the battle was consequence-free. You know, if, if they hit something, you saw an explosion outside the ship or something happening inside with the usual this. Uh, with CGI, there should be no reason you have to do that. You should be able to show the consequences of the action. You get a hole blown in your ship and you lose some stuff. Maybe it's not a human being, but you lose something, you know. Uh, otherwise, visual effects here are great, as always. Um, again, my only minor criticism on this is uh, it happens so rapidly that it was a little bit hard to follow the action in space. Um, that's also a problem with modern science fiction with uh, you know, CGI. Anything a director can think of, they can put to the screen. So that means that you can put fast-paced stuff with differing shot angles so rapidly that it's hard to follow the battle. It is okay to slow down a little bit or pull back from the action so you can see what the battle looks like. Um, feel free to do that. That is really my only other criticism. The special effects were, as always, great. Costume designer, once again. Uh, she's going to be, I think, for the whole series, Christine Black. And my regular viewer is going to get sick of me saying it, so I'll say it as quickly as I possibly can. Costumes are supposed to tell you something about the person wearing them. So, for example, if you saw me on the street, I'd be wearing a geeky t-shirt and jeans, and this would tell you something about me. Here on the show, I am wearing a costume. No one I know wears this. No one I've ever met wears this. This is a, uh, you know, this vest, the shirt, bow tie, the hat. These are all intending to push a brand. Something that tells you that I'm a kind of folksy guy giving you reviews from part of the country that don't usually get them. And that um, is relatively intelligent. I hope I come off as smart because I am... Nebraska represent, so it tells you that people in Nebraska maybe aren't as dumb as you think they are. But with the costume design, yeah, um, same thing happens here. Everybody, they're, not, they're wearing different things and it all works out, makes, tells you things about the character. But another thing that got baked into the franchise during that Berman era in particular was that everyone on any given planet tend to wear exactly the same thing. There is almost no individuality. Now, that's fine when you're dealing with uniforms that are like Starfleet or Klingon or Andorians, but when it comes down to the individuals on a planet, they should be wearing a lot of a variety of costumes. It's not like everyone on Earth is wearing exactly the same thing all the time. So when we see different people with very different costumes, it is nice to see, once again, that we have a costume designer who has unbaked that part of the franchise that should never have been in there. Makeup department head is James McKinnon, as always. And yet another thing about something being baked into the franchise during the Berman era was makeup. And that really had a detrimental effect on Vulcans. In the original series, Spock was the only Vulcan we ever saw with a bowl cut. His father, Sarek, had what's called a Caesar cut. Now, Vulcans, in, women in particular, were extremely well coiffed in the original series as was everybody else all the other women in the original series they had very nice hairstyles but baking in and basically starting with next gen and on baking in that all vulcans have bowl cuts was just dumb and not to mention just ugly as sin on all of the women who had them to begin with with my eye I can easily see that every single Vulcan woman of the Berman era was wearing a wig because their heads bulged at the back where they had their natural hair was being squashed down underneath this wig. If you can see it every time on Star Trek Enterprise when you see T'Pol in profile, her head sticks back abnormally. And that's because she's got her real hair stuffed under there. And by the way, take a look at where Jolene Blalock is playing the mirror to Paul where she has her own natural hair. Now you tell me which of those two things is far, far more attractive. And there's absolutely no reason that a Vulcan can't have something other than a freaking bowl cut. So when we see Vulcans and Romulans with different hairstyles, it is nice to see that a makeup designer has unbaked that part of the franchise. And I really encourage McKinnon to go even further with that and look at T'Pring from the original series, both as a young girl and as an adult, to get some inspiration from that. We saw some bull cuts among the Romulans here, but again, 
a lot fewer of them, me, I'd get rid of them all altogether. There's no reason for any of these people to be wearing bowl cuts. Just because we saw one guy wear them doesn't mean that everybody does. Another thing that got baked into the franchise in terms of makeup in the Berman era was the alien makeup. And this started with Star Trek The Motion Picture. The Klingon ridges seen there were so generally impactive um, that in the Berman era, almost every race had some kind of appliance on their forehead or their nose or combination. It was all up here for the most part. And it was really, really repetitive by the end of that era. So when we see aliens with very different makeup, it is definitely nice to see that the makeup designer has unbaked that part of the franchise. So at the end of any episode, we ask ourselves, is it any good? And no, no. My biggest gripe really is that due to the story structure, which I talk about in a link below, I was left literally saying, and, I, and when I say literally, I mean literally, not figuratively. I was literally left saying, what, that's it? That's all? And beyond that, the writing is so stupid in so many ways as to be irritating. I would not recommend this episode. However, if you're committed to watching the show, you must, unfortunately, watch every episode, good or bad, to get the entire story. Again, this relates to that dramatic structure issue that I've talked about in my, my uh, video, Star Trek Discovery and Picard Will Not Age Well, link below. So that's all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So a little bit of ad copy for next time in the uh, imperfectly in the uh, style of Ernie Anderson, one of those voiceover guys that you always heard. Next time on the Fandai Master's Review of Star Trek Picard, the crew of La Serena begin an unpredictable and lively expedition on Free Cloud to search for Bruce Maddox. Now they learn that Maddox has found himself in a precarious situation, and a familiar face offers her assistance. That's next time on the Fandai Master's Review of Star Trek Picard. So, thank you for watching. Um, that is really all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.